Welcome to the Battlefield to Blessing podcast. I'm Shaul. Great to have you listening in with us. And uh, welcome to Dion, my co-host. Dion, welcome back to the studio. Good day, Shaul, and good day to all our listeners. We are talking, or we're talking on the previous podcast about vets after their service, veterans, what happens when you get home. We spoke about leaving one hostile environment, going to another, which is less hostile, the changes in environment, the changes in our awareness and our preparedness for that. And we we went into a little bit of detail on each of these areas. But Dion, let, let's carry on with this this whole idea, vets after service, getting home, um, the struggles that one has to to deal with. But you, you've done some reading on this issue. Let, let's talk about that. Yeah, sure. There's an author called Barry Zorestein. He's an ex-Rhodesian war veteran. He was a combat medic. And then when he left the armed forces, he became a psychologist. And he has written two books. And the first one is called, Which Way Is Your Warrior Facing? And then he had a follow-up. And the second book was called, Which Way Is Your Claymore Mine Facing? And it's basically a a self-help book. It's a book, it's like a roadmap that um, helps veterans to transition into civilian life. And I just want to quote something from his book, which I thought is really, really important. And that's a choice that we make when we do the transitioning from a, um, a combat military type of role to Civvy Street. And I quote him, he says, I discovered that many soldiers would either turn their claim or mine inward or outward. Inward meant swallowing all the emotional turmoil until they couldn't take it anymore and often led to disastrous consequences. Outward meant releasing that turmoil in front of others. Both situations were unsustainable and toxic. Hmm. So I think it's profound what Barry is saying here. It's how do we respond? What does it look like when we transition, when we adapt to our new environment? And one can call the old environment abnormal because it was hostile, high risk, and you can call the new environment normal. That's low, low up risk. for debate. Yes. <laughs> And, and some people live in these environments all the time. They don't get to transition. They don't get to to move around and to get to a, a less hostile environment, which I think is even a more, more of a challenge for them. But often they don't even know the difference. And you've told me this before too, where even in war zones, you see people just going on with their day-to-day -day lives which is really strange. And I'm reading another book by a veteran right now, an American veteran, and he speaks about, you know, just before contacts with the enemy in a in a city, in city streets, and here people are going to work in the morning and they're getting in their cars and they're driving off. And this is just before massive shootout and bombs going off and people killing each other. And they just carry on with their lives. It, it just seems so, so strange. But... You know, when you're in that environment, I don't suppose you 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 want to bring some kind of normality. You can't just you can't just move away. Some do. So, you've been in these environments. Have you seen people just grab all their stuff and walk? Have you seen that? Oh, absolutely. Especially in Iraq, in the turmoil that uh, that basically evolved after the US and the coalition of the willing of 42 nations set out to depose Saddam Hussein in March 2003. And the first three, four years, there was a terrorist insurgency. There was the Shia and the Sunni attacking and killing each other on a, on a large industrial scale. And at the point that you raised, I was always amazed at the resilience of the people, it's almost like it became their new normal. For us, it was uh, very abnormal. Almost, I'm not really on the outside looking in because we were we were experiencing it. We were witnessing all the atrocities and the violence, 
and but but they lived they they live in a country that have now been plagued by violence for 20 years and they just seem to be getting on with life the their level of trauma and traumatization is not evident at face value you know looking at normal population and society they go about their daily routine they go to the shopping malls a car bomb explodes and it doesn't really disrupt their lives beyond the three or four hours that it takes for the police to clean up the scene Mm. and life just returns to so-called normal Mm. you know in south africa we've been through uh, a civil war some people might not call it that. I suppose it depends on where you lived uh, in South Africa. Very, very traumatic circumstances. And, uh, you know, we, we somewhat put up with quite a bit of trauma. I mean, I can't remember throughout my whole life any time of there being total peace and tranquility in our country. And it really shocked me when I remember we had some British young ladies staying with us many years ago. And somebody at one of the whoever terrorists in South Africa had blown up an ATM machine, which has happened every now and again. You know, they'd want the cash, so they they throw a petrol bomb or they blow it up or something. And I remember casually mentioning this to our guests. Oh, somebody's just blown up another ATM this afternoon in Claremont, in Cape Town. And these girls were, they they were traumatized by this. They were so worried and scared. And this is kilometers away or miles away from where we lived. And I realized then, you know, we were so what, somewhat, um, our, our minds had just started to live with these things. You know, every shop you went into, they checked all your bags. There were security guards at every door of every shop to see if you weren't carrying limpet mines or bombs or something or plastic explosives or whatever. That just became the norm in South Africa. And to other people living in other civilized countries, that was highly trauma- traumatized society. And... I was speaking to somebody from America who had actually come to South Africa and he's doing a lot of research on our socio-political, economic environment uh, at the time. This is many years ago in the in the early 90s. And he was saying that at that stage, that psychologists internationally were discussing that the South African society is one of the most traumatized societies in the world to live in at that time, in the 80s and um, moving into the 90s. So... Uh, it's just so strange because when we tell these stories, uh, and my son often points me points this out to me, that our stories are so crazy and so horrendous that we often don't get traction because nobody can relate to them in in normal Western societies. And I think if you look at your what you went through in Iraq, and now you're speaking to large men's groups, as you say, there are very few people that can actually relate. You know, but we as Christian men, we we need to we need to take the gospel to people. We need to relate to them. We need to make a difference. So, in your life, how are you using the gospel to connect with other men? Whether they, I mean, you've said, I mean, there are lots of people who listen to you. They can't relate at all. How do you use the gospel in your environment as Dion to reach out? to other vets or to those who haven't got a clue of what you're talking about? Like, how, how does this fit into your life? Yeah, I have engaged with many of my ex-police buddies and Iraq buddies over the past year. The Lord have made our paths cross. And in 90% of the cases, I had not seen them in quite some time. And many of them I would not seen before my conversion. So they... They meet up with this different person and 90% of the time they say, are you sure that you are Dion because you are so different? Because they can recall a hard and violent man, an extremely aggressive man. And now they have this meek and mild guy standing in front of them. And that has given me an opportunity, a beautiful, wonderful opportunity to share with them my conversion story and I've I have grabbed those opportunities to say to them you know that is what I was but that is not who I am anymore and I can see that they are still stuck in the past they still defined 
by their old identity. When you say stuck in the past, what, what are you talking about? Traumatized, bitterness, hatred, what, what kinds of ideas come to mind? I think it's all of that, Charles. All of that. It's a basket of, you know, as you say, anger, bitterness, and resentment, and just holding on to that to that false security of, of you know, that like brotherhood, as opposed to as we spoke in the previous episode, you know, rather holding on to your brothers and sisters in Christ, and holding on to the Lord Himself first and foremost as uh, the anchor of our souls. And not not trusting in our old skill sets that yeah. we acquired and our experience and knowledge and whatever else that we are now defined by something greater that we now have a higher calling a higher purpose I think that's important now the when you're speaking about this new identity that we we have in Christ how should that look do you think to outsiders. I mean, you've mentioned the new Dion that your friends can't fathom. They 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 think this is pretty weird. You know, has Dion died and been resurrected? Where, where's the old Dion? But what should we be striving for as Christian men who've been traumatized, we coming back after service, uh, we got family. Some of us don't have family. Some of us are still looking for a wife. How do we deal with these issues? Yeah, you know, it's important. They 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 knew me in my old life, so I almost have street cred, uh, what they call credibility. Yeah. Okay, been there, done that. It's an omen. It's an omen. You're the old yeah. man. Yes, <laughs> I was called an old buddy by <laughs> quite a few of my ex buddies. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I think that's important that that one can talk from both perspectives and say that that is value to connect to your old band of brothers. But now the connection is on a different level. We are no longer defined by our past. We are now defined in our new identity in Christ. And I share with them what that looks like. It's still about supporting. It's still about encouraging. It's still about loving, etc., etc. But a different environment. Absolutely. Yeah. I was doing some ministry mission work in the Democratic Republic of the Congo a while back. And at that time, I had a missionary with me and he brought a friend along who was actually a colonel in an army somewhere in the world. And uh, he had been in heavy conflict situations, also been through um, lots of contacts and what have you during his army life. And he was asked to give his testimony at a very large church in the Congo, about 3,000 people present. And it was quite funny because we we told him, or at least the, the host told him, under those circumstances that many years ago where there was no freedom of speech in the Congo at that time. We, we told him it was probably a good idea not to mention his military life. In other words, you know, you've got to give your testimony without mentioning the military. And he almost fell to pieces. He didn't have a testimony anymore. <laughs> and I remember the missionary saying to him, oh, come on, your identity is in Christ. It's not in you as a, as a soldier, you know. And he really had to rethink through this. And he did a really great job. He did give his testimony without <laughs> mentioning the military. But I suppose we've got to ask ourselves that very question. You know, if you had to give your testimony of Christ's work in your life, and you can never mention the fact that you are a veteran. I don't mean you personally, I mean to our listeners and, and people out there who are interested in this topic. What do you have to say for yourself? And so the idea of what does it look like for a vet or for somebody who's busy in a war zone right now, what does it look like to have the identity of Christ in those circumstances? And I'll never forget, I was... Um, once involved with a group of people that were considering um, protecting our area from the violence that was going on in South Africa. And um, we were talking about God and how things are different and what have you for Christians. And one person was saying, well, we all go into the same wars. We're all killing each other. What difference does it make whether you're Christian or any other religion? It makes no difference whatsoever. And and I said to him, no, but it does make a difference. The way we fight makes a difference. The way we think, the way we act, the way we do things. And really, the Lordship of Christ must impact every area of our lives. And if 
if he doesn't, then he's not Lord of our lives. So where to from here with that understanding, if somebody's in a war zone right now, how should other people see them? What should they be aiming for? What should they be looking like to their friends who aren't in Christ? Yes, most of the veterans that I speak to are fully aware of my friend Mark's death. And you might want to remind us about that uh, for those who have missed that program. Yeah, my, my best friend Mark was killed right in front of me in 2006, just outside Baghdad in Iraq. And I was in the seat that he was sitting in 20 minutes before he was killed. And I used that as an example to shock them into reality. And I and I tell them about a sermon that Jonathan Edwards, a very well-known American pastor and evangelist, gave in America in the 1700s, and he called it time. And that really made such a, pro- a profound impact on my life. And he said four things are really, really important to remember. And the first one is the shortness of life. The second one is the suddenness of death. The third one is the span of eternity. And the fourth one is the certainty of judgment. And when I speak to them about that, and I say, I've told you, Mark, how he died, and that he was in country for five months. And the night before he died, we went and bought his little daughter, five years old, Candy. And he had five days to go before he left the country to go home. And in an instant, the Lord took him. And I would focus on the suddenness of death. And no one knows the day and the hour when the Lord will call us to account. And we will all face judgment one day. And then I would ask the question, so how about you? What does your life look like? What does your soul look like if you were dying now of a heart attack or whatever? Where would you end up? Would the Lord say to you, welcome home, my good and faithful servant, into my rest? Or will he say to you, depart from me, your evildoer, I never knew you? And unfortunately, I've lost many so-called friends when I've um, shared that with them. But that is the truth. That is what uh, the Bible teaches us. And I I have won over many uh, veterans by talking to them um, in that manner, um, shocking them I- into reality. It's so interesting that you, that you say that you've lost friends because, uh, you know, in my time that I've been in a war zone, one of the things that I found really interesting was that you don't find any atheists, or at least I didn't find a single atheist in the war zone. I mean, people would swear, they'd be rude and obnoxious and all that kind of thing. But they all believe God existed. I don't remember ever coming across an atheist in the war zone, and and I'm not saying they don't exist, but I certainly didn't come across them. But the other thing, too, that is so important is that we are, as humans, made in the image of God. There's, there's no excuse. Everybody knows that God exists. Some don't want to talk about him. Some don't want to have to deal with him because we want to carry on in our own sin and live the, our lives the way we want to. We don't want an autonomous God to, last, to tell us how to live. And, and it's also quite strange because soldiers are also very independent people. So they don't want to have to rely on God and say, take the easy way out. But they quite happily rely on their buddy or their friend. You know, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever, the, the, the thinking. But your friend and your buddy in the army, he's the one probably that's getting drunk with you. You know, he's not the one that's calling you to repentance or to, to getting your life right with the Lord. So there's these dichotomies and these difficult circumstances that we, that we need to deal with. But let's, we've got to finish off pretty soon. What, what do you believe or how do you see um, the friends that you've dealt with, those you've lost some, you've made some. When you're dealing with these men, what is their common concern or aren't they open to discuss it with you? Like, uh, what is their reason for walking away and why are others very open to you discussing the gospel with them? 
Oh, you have mentioned it earlier on, you know, the strength that they derive from the, the, the so-called band of brothers, the cohesion. And there certainly is a very strong cohesion amongst that network of veterans. And that is their strength. That is their foundation. That is their sanctuary. That's all they know. And they are fearful to step out of that comfort zone. I can recall when I, I spent many years in Iraq and I had opportunities to come home and I opted not to come home. I opted to rather stay in a war zone, in a hostile environment, high-risk environment, because that was my new normal, as opposed to coming home, because I was fearful of, of having to adapt, having to transition into something new that I didn't know. So I clung to the past. And I just want to mention a, a, a key Bible verse, and that's found in Philippians 3. And the Apostle Paul says... One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So he is not saying forget the past. He's saying do not dwell on the past, but press on, strive, reach out, go forward. And I think that is key, yeah. not not to be stuck in the past. Very, very important. I think we, we only got a few minutes left, Jan. Just remind us again of the four important points that you spoke about earlier, the shortness of life, the sudden death. These are really important points. Just, just remind us of those again as we end the program. Yeah, I, I think the sermon was called um, The Use of Your Time. And Psalm 90 says, Lord, help me to to measure my time properly and to basically maximize the time that that you've given me. And as we spoke in the previous episode, to get out of the comfort zone and to encourage and support and love. And yeah, just to recap then, it's the shortness of life, the suddenness of death, the span of eternity Because we will all spend somewhere in eternity. There's no gray area. The Bible teaches clearly we will be with the Lord and His glorious presence forever. Or we will end up in a place called hell where we be eternally tormented and separated from His presence. And then the third one is the certainty of judgment. We will all, Christians and pagans alike, face judgment one day during which we will have to give an account of all the good and all the bad Mm. that we've done. Our pastor on just the past Sunday said, nobody's going to get away with anything. There's going to be a judgment. And so the question is, where are we? And you, our listener, where do we stand on this issue? Praise God that we are saved by God's grace through faith and not because of work we haven't done or still want to do. And so we can find forgiveness in Christ in dealing with our sin and all the chaos we might have caused or not caused in our life. So praise the Lord for that. Can I uh, just share one more verse? Please go ahead. Uh, Yes. Isaiah 43, verse 18 to 19 says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And I can testify to that, that the Lord Jesus is our living water, is our fountain of hope, he's our anchor for the soul. And yeah, do not dwell on the past. Forget the former things. I learn from it. Learn those lessons. Apply it. See the purpose in your pain, whether it's PTSD or transition stress or whatever it may be. Apply it to the glory of God. The Bible says he will give us rest. And it also says he'll give us life in abundance. So thank you for those verses, Dion. Thank you very much for chatting to us today. And God bless and keep up the good work. Well, my friends, there we are. Fighting.